My name's Garen Ewing, and I'm the writer and artist for The Adventures of Julius Chancer, and uh, The Rainbow Orchid is the main book that's been published by Egmont in the UK. Um, it's also available in Dutch, Spanish, French, and German, and it's available on the iPad from Panel 9 Comics. Um, and I'm going to talk a bit about how I make a page this is extracted from a slideshow I've done at quite a few book festivals and school talks, although this may be a bit more rambly because I'm um, just staring at my computer screen rather than a live audience. Um, but I hope it gives you some idea of how I work. This is the page I'm going to be talking about. It's the start of a two-page fight scene between my main characters who have gone into the lower mountains of the Hindu Kush in India and they've been followed by a the baddies who are trying to stop them on their quest to find the mythical rainbow orchid. They don't know yet if this flower actually exists but they're trying to find it in order to win a high stakes botanical competition back in the UK so that's the basics of the story it's set in the 1920s um, I love that era because it's got one foot in the Victorian age which kind of conjures up the idea of um, you know uh, high adventure and daring do and a world ready for exploration um, but it's also got a foot in the modern age of beautiful beautifully designed cars and airplanes and and the world was opening up but it wasn't there were still areas to explore and there's also that post world war 1 feeling uh, i especially wanted this comic to be very british um a lot of the 1920s set comics are set in the states perhaps you know in the era of prohibition and flappers and jazz and chicago gangsters this is very british um you've got that post world war 1 and that kind of looming world war 2 into war years uh, which i find very interesting so let's have a look at my process now this is the finished page you can see it with the coloring and the lettering and everything on it but I start out something like this. This is the first stage of my script, um, which I tend to do freehand because I just find, um, you know, you think of something and you can write it down instantly. You can scribble, you can point arrows, make notes, do sketches. Don't have to worry about anything technical, keyboards spelling mistakes grammar <laughs> you can just write it down straight away it's it's you know from brain to paper without any kind of middleman of any kind so this is a very simple script because it's a fight scene there's not a lot of dialogue because I'm drawing the comic as well um, I tend to be quite sparse with my descriptions of panels so you can see on the script um, it's page 39 well, it was page 39 of volume 2, as Rainbow Orchid was originally published in three volumes. And down the side, I've got the panel numbers. There's 14 panels. And then there's a brief description of what's in the panel and any dialogue that the characters are saying. You can also see on this page, and in the top right of the page, there's a, there's a list which I've ticked off. And those are all the things I want to have happened by the time the page ends. Uh, it's very important for the structure. I, I know I've only got two pages for this scene and certain things have to have happened by the time it ends. Of course this is just the script, there's the whole plotting process which is a, a sort of kind of a separate notebook really where all that's already happened. Um, below that list there's a little sketch, uh, very rough. Um, I guess here I, I've got my characters, uh, one of the baddies is Box and he's throwing a stone at another character, Meru, and it's hitting him on the head and knocking him out. And I probably did this sketch because I wanted to make sure that I could do that throwing, hitting process in one panel. Um, so I just drew it just to make sure that it didn't need two or three or whatever and, and just to make sure it, it worked okay and perhaps to get a little idea of, of how the throw would work. So it's very rough. Um, and then below that there's a little note and if you can read it it says Mauser pistol eight shots 
nine if one in the chamber. That's a little research note because I want Evelyn Crow, who's the leader of the 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 dastardly baddie group. Um, she has a pistol, and I, uh, in fact, it's appeared in the story already. A 1915 German pistol called a Mauser, and it gets fired several times over the next couple of pages. So I needed to know how many shots this particular Mauser could fire, the answer being eight, um, nine if there's uh, also a bullet in the chamber. So I knew I, I couldn't exceed that number of shots. So that's all part of the initial scripting process, a little bit of working out, um, writing the script, making notes, perhaps doing a few sketches. And I'll also, while I'm writing, I will make a thumbnail of the page, but I'll show you that after this, which is the next stage of the script where I actually type it up. And this is really just a second draft. I'll probably change the dialogue, maybe a little more detail on the panel descriptions, but I've got a pretty good idea already in my mind what they look like, especially along with the thumbnails as well. Um, but there it is now on the computer, and I can also copy and paste that text for the lettering later. These are the thumbnails, uh, which I will do alongside writing the script. They're very small, they're you know, sort of one and a half inches by two inches or something. It's really for layout, um, to make sure all the panels fit on the page, to make sure I'm not doing too much overcrowding, um, to make sure that the tiers, which are the bands, I've got four tiers to a, a page on, on the kind of comics I do, um, quite often I want a, perhaps a very tiny little mini cliffhanger at the end of each tier just to draw the reader along down the page. Not always, but it's nice if that can happen. Uh, so really that's what that's for, maybe working out very roughly where the characters, who at this stage are just not much more than blobs, where they go on the panel to make sure they're speaking in the right order or standing in the right order so that any dialogue is read in the right order that kind of thing um, you know is it a long shot or a close-up again just done in blobs really but just working out these kind of first basic bits of the story um, so that's the first set of roughs I then do 90% um, of the time, not all the time, sometimes I work from the thumbnails but I, I quite often will do a more detailed rough version of the page. This is done on A4, so it's, it's a bit bigger, closer to the final printed size. And this is really a, more about working out the postures and poses of the characters. Again, um, you know, long shot, mid-range, whatever. But there's no... with this stage of the drawing it's rough. I don't care about the getting it technically right um, or, or any kind of perfection. So it's a really good first stage to get a lot of that early work out of the way. So when you come to do the final page, the final drawing, I've already done a lot of the working out. And I can, if I was going straight to the final drawing, I may find a, a certain figure a little bit difficult and end up rubbing it out. Think, oh no, maybe I'll try this angle, that angle. And I don't want to do that on the final page, as well as trying to draw it as correctly as possible. So doing a rough means you can just scribble it out, scribble the drawing and... Um, not worry about getting it right, but also see how it can work. So when you come to do the final one, all that all that's done. There will still be changes. If you see the third panel, so the third panel on, on the top tier, um, that changes. Um, because looking at it on the rough, I saw that I've got three panels in a row with just the backs of people's heads. <laughs> so um, the third panel gets changed. And then another example of something I... I kind of discovered from this part of the process was below the halfway mark there's two panels on top of each other where the Afridi tribesman is attacking Julius um, he's got a kyber knife and Julius has got a, a stick with fire um, and I knew what I wanted to do but when I came to actually draw it I realized that the hands the, the way the two characters interact is quite complicated so I, I had to kind of rework that from this rough another another change that you'll see on the on the very bottom two middle panels uh, Julius strikes Evelyn Crow and knocks the gun out of her hand and then she strikes him but I had both Julius and Evelyn facing the same way in their attacks and I th 
think I'm right, uh, we'll look at it in a minute, that I turned Evelyn round just to, just so that the two panels, because we're we're flipping round, um, they're both going the same way. It looks just looks a little bit odd. Okay, the next stage is the finished artwork um, pencil stage. The first stage is done in pencils. So here you can see some of the changes. So that third panel, I've brought the the view, the reader's view, close to the ground, and you see Evelyn and Box's feet speeding down the hill towards the small figures, which is a, a lot more dramatic, but also solves the problem of three panels in a row. Uh, it's just the backs of people's heads. Below the halfway mark, the, two, the Julius and Aphrodite fight scene has been worked out now where the hands are going and how that can work. Um, and again, the, the very last two panels, you can see I've turned Evelyn round. And it just gives a nice symmetry to the previous panel and uh, I think I think works a lot better so this will one question I get asked a lot is how long a page takes um, and that really depends on what's on the page so there's there's pages with a lot of buildings and cars and airplanes they're going to take a lot longer uh, this one had some quite complicated character interactions so that had its own kind of challenges that took a bit of time but the background was just trees so that wasn't so bad quite often backgrounds can be the thing that that take up more time but it will take me on average I'd say somewhere around sort of I, I think about 14 hours I worked it out as seemed to be an average it, it can be 8 it can be 25 you know but um, something like this, probably I probably did over two days, half a page a day, um, you know, without without having to work past midnight, sort of thing, which you can do. I, you, know, you could do a fourteen-hour page in a in a long day, of course. So, um, but that gives some idea of perhaps how long it takes. The next stage is to ink it, and that's done straight onto the onto the page. I I don't ink digitally. I, I like to. Uh, I use a dip pen. Uh, Black India ink, and I, I like that feeling of the dip pen nib actually touching the paper. And um, I did try a Cintiq once, and I didn't like the gap between the the nib of the, the stylus and then you know a few millimeters of glass before the actual line appeared. I'd probably get used to it, I'm sure, but I really do like the brain to hand to pen to paper link <laughs> all touching. So inking is, is really just going over the pencils, choosing the right lines. Um, some of it's quite small and detailed, so you have to be careful that perhaps a subtle smirk on your very small face, you know, if you, if you don't quite get the same, you, you may have got it just right in pencil, and a, a very slight change can turn a smirk into a sarcastic grin or something. So... Um, you just have to be careful, but but this is a lot more of a, a relaxing stage of the drawing for me. I I just can uh, sit down and get on with that, and that's probably a day, you know, a, a sensible day's work. I scan that artwork and at high resolution, uh, pure black and white bitmap into the computer, and that's where I do my colouring in Adobe Photoshop. Um, you can see I use mostly flat colours. Um, there's a couple of reasons for that. One, there's a lot of information on the page. There's uh, a lot of panels in this style of comic, which is modelled after the Franco-Belgian classic albums, uh, Lean Claire type stuff. So too many shadows and gradients and um, that kind of thing will complicate it. So I like to keep it flat and simple. It also fits with the uh, sort of kind of clear line aesthetic that I'm working in um, that kind of school of comics and also it makes I mean this whole style of layout which I, I really love it's very simple but it really keeps you concentrating on the narrative of storytelling I'm learning still learning about how to tell comics in this style but I, I find it more and more satisfying um, there is an art to it I've still got a lot to learn but it's it's great fun but it really keeps you focused on the storytelling and it's very accessible for non-comics readers which is great yeah they can come to this and they know where 
to put their eyes <laughs> for the the next panel. Uh, actually, some people don't even even as simple as this, and you can't get much simpler. Um, they find difficult, but most people are able to pick up a comic like this, and it just it just draws them in. The nice, simple, clear graphic style of the page is not a put off to most people. Um, the final stage after the colouring is lettering. As I said, there's not a lot on this. There's a little bit of dialogue, but it's mostly fight scene action and movement. So uh, for the lettering, I I didn't want to use someone else's font. I, I had done in the past. Um, so this, I made my own font, and it's based on my own handwriting, although my, my neatest handwriting, which never actually gets used in real life. <laughs> and... Um, uh, that's it really i i do the i do the the lettering in photoshop although when it goes to the publisher they tend to redo it in what you know quark express i think they use just for that uh, absolute clarity um a few little other aspects of comic creation um is the research so this doesn't relate to the page i've just shown you but i'll just go through some of these quickly the bregway 280t is an aircraft that features in the comic I chose it because I needed a French aeroplane that could get my characters from France to Karachi in India, what well, was India in the 20s, what's now Pakistan. I later discovered only 21 of these aircraft were actually made, about 21. Uh, but I was able to get hold of the blueprints and a friend of mine made a balsa wood model. So I was able to draw it from any angle because there weren't... Um, although I've, made, I've built up a small collection of postcards and a couple of photographs and there's a little bit online as well I wanted to be able to draw it quite freely from any angle so um, that model really helped and you'll see that here it is in the comic there's quite a standard view of of the aeroplane on that top at the end of that top tier where the two characters are running away from from it um, although I did use the model for that. I did have a photograph that was similar but not quite right, so I used the model. And then especially for the panel below that, the last panel, I had no reference for it from behind. So using the blueprints and the model, I was able to get a fairly accurate representation of that. Um, another aspect of the Rainbow Orchid are quite a few animals up here. And again, as far as reference goes, I didn't want to just copy, find a photograph on... Google Images and copy it because uh, I had very specific poses I needed for the animals. Um, a snow leopard there and the elephant which had to sort of run across the grounds. And I wanted to create my own. I wanted to get used to knowing these animals. So I just sketched them quite a lot from photographs, um, but mainly video as well because you get a sense of the movement. Um, I, I bought a BBC documentary on DVD about snow leopards and made a lot of sketches um, and also to get used to cats I, I, I had a cat when I, I did this and did a few sketches of her mostly when she was sleeping which wasn't very useful but it's the only time she stood still <laughs> um, and again with the elephant I found video of although I needed an adult elephant I found video of a baby elephant running so I made a few sketches of that so I could I could get used to that here's a scene with the this is the elephant scene with Nathaniel, the elephant gets scared by uh, seeing a snake and then bolts and uh, Nathaniel in his attempts to stay on and it's a rather painful end but that was great fun, elephants are good fun to draw this is a uh, the Natural History Museum in London now the building hasn't changed much since it was built in about 1880 there is a statue there on that first exterior picture there's I don't know if you can see it there's a statue at the apex of the middle roof which fell off in the 1940s um, I think only one part of its anatomy which I, I won't mention <laughs> remains and that's being used as a was discovered being used as a paperweight on on one of the staff members tables <laughs> but in the 20s the statue was still there so and the inside the the diplodocus cast which now sits and has done you know since the 70s or maybe even earlier I think that, that occupies the main hall. Back in the 20s, there was a, a big elephant called George who, who was there, a stuffed elephant. But the Diplodocus cast was kept in the reptile room, which is what you see in the last picture there. And there's things like now the tail of the Diplodocus is now kept up in the air because we know we, it balanced, it walked along and used it for balance, whereas 
back then it, they just thought it dragged along the ground or something. And in the middle picture you can see again that in the 1920s they had two elephant heads stuck on the back wall, rather, rather grotesque. Getting these things right, some people say, you know, why bother? Who, who cares? No one's going to know. But I really feel as though, um, apart from it being very interesting and I learn stuff, the more important thing is I want to make the world as real as possible because it really helps the reader to enter into the world of the story, get lost. That's, that's really my aim, is to get that reader lost and completely enveloped by the story and the world. And making the world as believable as possible helps do that. I used to love when I read Asterix and Tintin, I got lost in those stories because the world was so believable. And a lot of that is down to the research of uh, making it believable. So I, I kind of want to, that's my ambition as well. I just want people to feel as though, you know, suddenly look up and an hour's gone by or something and their, their tea's cold on the side, that, that kind of feeling. Quite difficult to do with a, a comic because you're so open to distraction, uh, whereas a film can capture you totally uh, with its music and its moving images and its bright lights and uh, although you're more you're more directed as a viewer whereas with a comic it's a, it's actually a lot more interactive anyway that's um part of the reason why i like to get things like that right and um, be quite strong on the research and this last aspect of the research i'll talk about is a um, couple of languages that appear so i've got some ancient greek that appears in a couple of places in the story, and um, I went to a, an expert translator called Quintus, not his real name, I suspect, <laughs> and he helped me with that, so that's authentic ancient Greek that appears in the story. And even more obscure is the language of the Klasha people who live in Chitral, uh, up in the northern, what's now Pakistan, um, up in the mountains of Chitral, and the valley, well, the valleys there. And Kalasha is spoken, I think, by about 4,000 people. It's an endangered language because the Kalasha themselves are slowly being converted to Islam and their culture is disappearing. And they've got, they're a very unique culture. They've got, you know, they're kind of pagan in their worship of, of gods. And, um, you know, they, they survived a cull by the, the kind of Afghan king in the 1900s who, who turned all the kind of pagan lands to Islam but they actually I think they're protect, protected by the the British and um, have managed to survive just about to this day but um, again I wanted to get that Kalasha language right and all my studies online I, I would never you know there's a few word lists and I could have perhaps made it up I would have never got the grammar right um, but anyway, I eventually tracked down after quite a long time and, and, and built up the courage to get in touch with a lady called Elsa Cooper, who with her husband actually gave the Kalasha their first, first written version of their language because they didn't have one before then. So she was instrumental um, in that and she was very generous in helping me translate my dialogue to authentic Kalasha along with an indigenous Kalasha speaker. So that's great to get this very obscure language into the book. Get it exactly. So that's the that's kind of some of the process of making the Rainbow Orchid. I hope you've found that interesting and you can find out more on my website at rainboworchid.co.uk.